Thank you for joining us for our introduction to veterinary homeopathy webinar. I am your presenter. My name is Lisa Melling. I am a veterinarian and a certified veterinary homeopath. I am a faculty instructor with the Pitt Perrin Institute of Veterinary Homeopathy. The goals of the presentation are as follows. We will compare allopathic to the homeopathic approach to disease. We will discuss the role of the vital force in the law of similars. We will explain the origins of homeopathy and the preparations of homeopathic remedies. We will discuss applications for homeopathy in veterinary practice. We will differentiate between acute and chronic disease treatment with homeopathy. We will provide case presentations where homeopathic treatment was used. And we will discuss homeopathic training, certification, and continuing education. We will also provide you with a recommended reading list and resources for more information. To understand homeopathy, it is best to clearly define allopathy, or contraria contraris. Allopathy uses the law of opposites. It's a method of treating disease by the use of agents that produce effects different from those of the disease treated. In the allopathic approach to disease, the first step is to categorize the illness. We will call something renal disease or hyperthyroidism or Cushing's disease. And then we have a set protocol for addressing that type of illness in the patient. The next step is to suppress the disease symptoms. If there are infections, antibiotics are given. If there is swelling, anti-inflammatories are prescribed. If there is vomiting, antiemetics are administered. And for the more severe illnesses, such as autoimmune diseases, high doses of immunosuppressants are used. In all of these cases, frequent repetition of the medicine is often needed to maintain an effect, and the symptoms may return if the drug is discontinued. There are also side effects to most of the medications prescribed. Homeopathic treatment uses an approach opposite of allopathy. Homeopathy uses the law of similars, like cures like, or similia similibus curentur. In homeopathy, any medicine that can produce morbid symptoms in a healthy patient will remove similar symptoms occurring as an expression of disease in the ill patient. Homeopathic remedies are individualized for each patient to match their own signs of illness. In homeopathy, the vital force is the energy that maintains the life in the individual. This is referred to as qi in traditional Chinese medicine. The vital force is responsible for maintaining balance and normal function in the body. Symptoms of illness are simply the vital force's response to imbalance and its attempts to return the body to normal function. In homeopathic prescribing, a patient's totality of symptoms are used to identify one matching remedy that will be given to catalyze the vital force to begin the healing process and return the patient to health. There are several examples of the application of the law of similars in modern medicine, where small doses of a similar substance are used to stimulate a reaction in the body. For example, large doses of radiation cause cancer, but small doses of radiation are used to treat cancer. Large doses of digitalis cause heart arrhythmias, but small doses of digitalis are used to treat heart arrhythmias. And if Ritalin is taken by a normal person not suffering from hyperactivity, the result will be a hyperactive reaction. Whereas when Ritalin is given to a hyperactive child, it calms their behavior. Samuel Hahnemann is considered the founding father of homeopathy. He was a German physician who lived from 1755 to 1843. He was fluent in many languages and would often supplement his income by translating medical texts. In 1789, he was translating a paper written by a prominent physician named Dr. Cullen, who was arguing that Peruvian bark, also known as cinchona, was an effective treatment for malaria due to its bitter astringent properties. Hahnemann disagreed and placed his own footnote in the paper disputing the physician's conclusion. He argued that there are other more bitter roots that exist that are not effective in treating malaria. And to prove his point, he took repeated doses of the cinchona bark 
until he developed symptoms that matched the signs of malaria. His conclusion was that the cinchona bark is curative of malaria because it causes symptoms similar to those of the disease. Dr. Hahnemann wanted to see if there were other medicines present in nature that had similar curative properties. So he began testing other substances on himself and on family and friends that volunteered. He found that the medicines would have a more gentle response in the patient if they were diluted. He began a process of potentization, which is a serial dilution, taking one part medicine and 99 parts distilled water, and then shaking it vigorously, a process called succussion. He repeated this process to different strengths or potencies, and he found that the higher the potency, the more gentle the reaction on the patient, and the more rapidly their symptoms were resolved. The potencies ascend from 6C, 12C, 30C, 200C, 1M, 10M, 50M, and MM. The higher the potency, the longer and more deeply the effect of the medicine, and the less frequently they had to be repeated. Homeopathy respects the body's innate ability to heal and sees the symptoms as a warning sign of a deeper problem rather than something that needs to be suppressed. This can be compared to the check engine light warning in a car. We would not simply unplug the fuse that warns us of a problem with the engine. We take the car to the mechanic to identify the underlying cause. Homeopathy uses small doses of substances that are an exact match to the symptoms in the patient. The homeopathic medicine is not simply repeated on a set schedule, but it depends on the patient's response. Homeopathic treatment stimulates and strengthens the immune defenses and results in an overall improvement in general health. There are many applications for homeopathy in veterinary medicine. Homeopathy is effective in treating many types of illnesses, including acute and infectious disease, injuries and trauma, and more severe symptoms and conditions of chronic disease. Homeopathy can be used to treat any species, small animals, pocket pets, exotics, wildlife, horses, and livestock. It is inexpensive, and the same homeopathic medicine can be used for small animals as well as large. When homeopathy is prescribed in food animals, there are no withdrawal times, and when used properly, there are no side effects. The homeopath's goal is to find the matching homeopathic remedy which produces the same symptoms in a healthy patient as the symptoms seen in the sick patient. The first step in selecting the homeopathic medicine is to evaluate the case and identify the symptoms as acute or chronic disease. This determines not only the remedy selection, but the frequency of dosing. When prescribing on acute illness, a simple case analysis of the current symptoms is performed, and the homeopathic prescription results in a rapid improvement of all symptoms. When prescribing on chronic disease, the case analysis is based on the totality of symptoms in the patient, both historical and current, and the prescription results in a gradual return to health, beginning with a rapid return of the patient's general well-being. Acute illness examples include trauma, shock, and wounds, corneal injuries, post-operative analgesia, gastroenteritis, upper respiratory illness, and colic. In the first two sessions of the Pitcairn Institute's professional course in veterinary homeopathy, students learn to recognize the remedies in their keynotes, which are often indicated in the treatment of acute problems. For example, Arnica is used in the treatment of shock, traumatic injuries, and post-operative analgesia. Calendula is used to stimulate wound healing and reduce scar tissue. Nux vomica, arsenicum album, pulsatilla, and cinchona are effective remedies to treat gastrointestinal disorders. Students will learn to work up a case, use the homeopathic repertory, and create a symptom analysis. They will also become comfortable with selecting the potency and treatment schedules for their patients. Chronic disease that responds well to homeopathic treatment includes allergies, ear infections, 
feline lower urinary tract disease and cystitis, immune-mediated conditions such as immune-mediated fever, masticatory myositis, inflammatory bowel disease, and even cancer. In sessions two through five in the Pitcairn Institute's professional course in veterinary homeopathy, students learn to recognize all the symptoms in a patient as an expression of their chronic disease. Remedy selection is based on the historical symptoms throughout the patient's lifetime. For example, a patient with a history of ear discharges, cystitis, vomiting, and a ruptured CCL will receive one homeopathic remedy that fits all of these conditions. Students will also learn to utilize essential computer software and reference material to streamline and guide prescription selection. In learning the applications for homeopathic prescribing for chronic disease, students will learn remedies that are most indicated in the treatment of chronic illness and develop case strategies and decide on follow-up prescriptions. There will be training on advanced study of case analysis where the students learn to do an in-depth case study prescription and response evaluation and understand how homeopathy uses all symptoms to identify and treat the imbalance in the vital force. In summary, effective homeopathic prescribing restores health with a single homeopathic remedy which is used to treat multiple symptoms. Homeopathic treatment improves the patient's well-being, general health, and decreases their susceptibility to future illness. So why add homeopathy to your practice? One of the benefits is utilizing one medicine per patient at a time so we can truly understand the patient's response to treatment. Homeopathy stimulates healing instead of suppressing symptoms of illness, and there are no undesirable drug effects. Homeopathic treatment results in a rapid return of a patient's well-being and is inexpensive to stock and prescribe because the same remedy can be used across species. Now we're going to give some case presentations to show how homeopathy is used in veterinary practice. For the purpose of this introductory presentation, each case example briefly demonstrates symptom selection, case analysis, prescription selection, dosage frequency and potency, and follow-up monitoring. This first case comes to us from my house call practice. On October 17, 2014, Riley, a nearly six-year-old spayed female golden retriever, was scheduled for suture removal 17 days following a TPLO to repair a ruptured left cranial cruciate ligament. The owner requested evaluation of vomiting that started 30 minutes after dinner 24 hours ago. Riley's symptoms of gastrointestinal upset included vomitus that contained partially digested food, She'd refused breakfast that morning and vomited phlegm with mucus. She'd eaten grass and vomited three more times that afternoon. And she was currently thirstless, though normally she drinks water regularly. Riley's case was analyzed using a homeopathic software program for rapid analysis. The symptoms are translated into rubrics, seen in the rows on the left, and then matching homeopathic remedies are listed in the columns on the right. They are abbreviated as follows, ARS for arsenicum, PULS for pulsatilla, NUXV for nux vomica, and PHOS for phosphorus. The intensity of the blue color, as well as the listing of the remedies in order, identifies which one most closely matches the collection of symptoms seen in the patient. Because pulsatilla has a keynote of vomiting accompanied by thirstlessness, a single prescription of pulsatilla 200C was administered, and the staples from the previous surgery were removed. Five minutes after the pulsatilla was administered, Riley was walked outside and passed a sock in her feces. One hour later, at the 6 p.m. progress report, the owner phoned to say that Riley did not vomit again, but passed another loose stool that contained two more socks. The owner was advised to feed her half of her normal meal and call in an hour. At 7 p.m., the owner phoned to report that Riley was back to normal and was eating well, with no signs of nausea. When going through the laundry pile, the owner found three mismatched socks. 
This is another case that comes to us from my house call practice in Michigan. This is a hen showing signs of acute respiratory distress. On February 20th, 2015, it was an especially cold, frigid week in Michigan. The patient is an eight-month-old speckled Sussex hen who is showing signs of unthriftiness, a barking cough with wheezing, and increased respiratory effort. The symptoms seem aggravated by the sub-zero temperatures, so the owner brought the hen indoors for care. A computer software program was used to perform a homeopathic analysis. The symptoms are translated into rubrics, shown in rows on the left, and identified matching homeopathic remedies in the columns on the right. The remedies are abbreviated as follows. HEP for Hepar Self-Calcaria, K-A-L-I-B-I for Calibrichromium, and B-R-O-M for Bromium. Because Hepar Self-Calcarium is indicated in cases of bronchitis, pneumonia, and asthma that are aggravated in cold, dry air, a prescription of 30C potency was dissolved in water, and the owner was instructed to give one dose every two hours until improvement was noted. Two hours after the second dose had been administered, the owner phoned to say that the respirations and coughing had improved and the hen was making normal chicken sounds. She was demonstrating improved energy and activity, though some wheezing was persisting. The owner was advised that this is a sign of a curative response and she should only repeat another dose if the hen's improvement stalled or the symptoms worsened again. Two days following treatment, the owner phoned to say that the hen was doing great and she had not needed more than the two doses of remedy that were given. Her symptoms had completely resolved and she had great energy. The owner was planning to return her to the flock outside. Four months later, in June of 2015, I was at the owner's home to do wellness exams on her dogs and this picture was taken of the hen who was reported to be thriving. Kit Kat is another example of a case that comes from my house call practice in Michigan. On November 10th, 2014, Kit Kat, a five-year-old spayed female domestic short hair that is indoor and outdoor, had a presenting complaint of stiff gait, lethargy, and pain in the dorsal lumbar and hip region. She had a decreased interest in going outside that day, and for two days, she'd had a decreased appetite progressing to anorexia. Physical exam findings revealed palpable heat and soft tissue swelling in the left hip and left dorsal lumbar region with extreme pain even on gentle palpation. She had a stiff gait with decreased range of motion in her left hip and was hiding, not wanting to be around her family. The extreme grumpiness when she was touched and examined was a major departure from this normally sweet cat's behavior. During the exam, she was hissing and tried to bite when her temperature was taken. Kit Kat's case evaluation was done using a homeopathic computer software program. And again, we see the symptoms translated into rubrics on the left, followed by the columns which show the matching homeopathic remedies. We have Hepar Self Calcaria as the best match, followed by Nux Vomica, Sulfur, and Burrita Carb. In reviewing these homeopathic remedies, it was concluded that Hepar Self Calcarium was the best match to Kit Kat's condition because this remedy is noted for wounds that are extremely sensitive to touch. And Kit Kat's severe personality change was significant enough to guide in the selection of this remedy. Hepar Self Calcarium 200C was prescribed and a single dose was administered at the visit. The treatment plan for Kit Kat was to offer her food that evening to see if she would eat. If she was feeling better, the return of her appetite and increased energy will be the first signs of improvement, and the owner was told not to redose if improvement is observed. But if she's still grumpy or does not want to eat, the owner was instructed to give another dose that evening. The following morning, Kit Kat's owner phoned to say that her appetite was still decreased, but she was eating better than yesterday. The owner was advised to repeat the remedy at that time and midday and phoned the following day with a progress report. 36 hours after the visit, the owner phoned to say Kit Kat was much better today, 
eating well, and allowing her back to be touched, socializing well with the other family members. The owner was advised to discontinue treatment and phone if the return of symptoms occurred. This next case comes to us from Dr. Sarah Steegs, homeopathic house call practice in North Yorkshire, England. On May 27, 2014, Penny, a 25-year-old Shetland mare, developed acute signs of colic. She had no previous history of colic, but had been turned out on a new grass field that day and brought in that evening showing signs of distress. She had bloating in her caudal abdomen, she was not passing manure, refusing to eat, and acting painful. The owner called out the closest emergency practice, and a diagnosis of gas colic was made. Penny received an IV injection of Flunix and Meglamine at 7.45 p.m. At 9 p.m., the owner contacted Dr. Stieg and said that Penny was not showing any signs of improvement, was still painful, and would not eat. She was instructed to wait a full two hours for the onset of action of Vanamine unless Penny showed any signs of worsening and then she must contact Dr. Stieg immediately. At 9.45, the owner phoned again, reporting no change. At this point, Penny's current symptoms were distension of her caudal abdomen, pain on palpation, leading this normally sweet horse to try to bite. She'd also burped three times in the last two and a half hours and had not passed any manure. A homeopathic analysis was done using a computer software program, listing the symptoms translated into rubrics on the left and identifying the matching homeopathic remedies in the columns on the right. We have belladonna, hina or cincona, calicarb, aconite, arsenicum, and ipecac. Because belladonna is a homeopathic remedy noted for aggravation from touch, and Penny trying to bite when her abdomen was touched, was an extreme change from her normal very sweet disposition, Belladonna was selected as her fitting homeopathic remedy. At 10 p.m., a single dose of Belladonna 1M was administered. Within five minutes of the dose, Penny began to visibly relax, and within 15 minutes, she passed a pile of manure and began eating. Over the next two hours, her abdomen gradually looked less bloated. Penny was monitored throughout the night, but she returned to normal and no further medication was needed. This next case comes to us from my house call practice in Michigan. Ringo, a two-year-old neutered male golden doodle, presented on June 10th, 2011 for decreased range of motion and atrophy in his masticatory muscles. The symptoms began within one month of multiple vaccinations. On April 21st, 2011, a 2M autoantibody test was positive, and he was diagnosed with masticatory myositis. He was prescribed and completed a six-week course of immunosuppressive prescription of prednisone, which was finished 10 days prior to his intake exam. Symptoms of illness included carrying treats without chewing them, dropping food or crying out when eating, grazing instead of his normal gobbling of his kibble, the preference to lie on cold tile, but no other personality change existed. He always wanted to be the center of attention. Several times during the consultation, Ringo turned his head to the side as if he was attempting to yawn and then cried out as he stretched his jaw muscles. On physical exam, Ringo jumped frequently but did not bark. He had moderate atrophy of his masticatory muscles and resistance and pain when his mouth was attempted to open wide. Otherwise, his physical exam was unremarkable. The initial plan, since the prednisone had only been completed 10 days prior, was that the owner improve his diet by home cooking and to call when the symptoms of illness returned. On July 5, 2011, the owner phoned to say that Ringo's jaw pain was back to the same level as it was prior to the steroids, and the single dose of phosphorus 10M was prescribed. Following the remedy, no improvement was noted, so Ringo's case was reevaluated for a new prescription. On September 9, 2011, a single dose of Lysinum 1M was prescribed. Lysin is indicated for symptoms of stiff jaw muscles with inclination to yawn, especially when symptoms occur following a rabies vaccination, as Ringo's symptoms did. Following his prescription, the owner was instructed to send regular email updates. 
On day two, she emailed to say Ringo seems a bit better. He has his energy level back. Day seven following the prescription, she wrote to say Ringo seems to be a lot better. He has all his energy back. He isn't yelping when he yawns, and it seems a lot less painful. On day 14, she wrote Ringo is definitely better. He has tons of energy, his mouth is opening a little wider, and he doesn't seem to be in as much pain. Six weeks following the listen prescription, Ringo was barking normally. He was able to fully open his mouth without pain when the owner had to remove a piece of candy he was trying to eat. And it was estimated that he has 75% of his range of motion back in his jaw. The owner was happy to report that he was playing ball again and able to run with a tennis ball in his mouth, tagging people with the ball. Ringo's jaw pain has never returned. Despite muscle atrophy that occurred at the time of illness, he has no trouble or pain fully opening his mouth. He is currently receiving homeopathic treatment for his waxy ears. This next case of equine strangles comes to us from Dr. Sarah Steeg's house call practice in North Yorkshire, England. On August 4th, 2012, Marmite, a standard bred cross French trotter two-year-old filly, lived on a horse breeding dealing facility which had strangles endemic on the property with recurrent outbreaks. Her presenting complaints were acute submaxillary lymph node swelling, left worse than right, soft tissue swelling underneath the left maxilla involving severe swelling of the left cheek and throat latch region, lethargy, malaise, and a decreased appetite. When offered, the client declined further diagnostics. A single dose of Calcarea Carbonica 10M was administered to Marmite. This remedy was selected for its affinity for glandular swelling below the jaw and the neck with abscesses in deep muscles and painful swelling and separation of submaxillary glands. 24 hours following the prescription, Marmite became much brighter in herself and had a returned interest in feed. The swelling reduced around her cheek and throat latch region. And 48 hours following the prescription, the abscess ruptured, the swelling reduced further, and she had a complete return to normal behavior. The picture was taken from underneath to show the left lymph node rupturing 48 hours after the prescription was administered. Marmite's healing response continued. The draining abscess and all swelling resolved between four and seven days post-remedy, and no further treatment was needed. This case comes to us from Dr. Stieg's homeopathic house call practice in North Yorkshire, England. Taz, a four-year-old neuter male border collie from a working line, had presenting complaints of problematic behavior described as fearful, anxious, noise sensitive, and fear aggressive. On physical exam, he had an overbite with a class two malocclusion mandibular disocclusion, a significant overbite, overshot jaw giving the shark-like appearance. The mandible was displaced caudally by more than two centimeters, but the patient was very nervous and difficult to measure. This resulted in the tongue protruding to varying degrees 100% of the time. This problem behavior was first observed at four to five weeks of age by the breeder, and despite extensive training in behavioral modification, the symptoms were little modified by four years of age. Taz was wary of people, fear aggressive with strangers approaching on the street and entering the home, and was known to run and hide from strangers. He was hypersensitive, hyperreactive, and when stressed will urinate. He panics with raised voices and shouting and demonstrates displacement activity, chewing his front legs when stressed. He's never shown interest in playing with the other dogs, either new dogs he's just met or the three other housemates. Dr. Steve performed two homeopathic analyses using computer software. In the first analysis, we see the symptom of the overshot jaw translated into the rubric of general dwarfishness development growth affected. She also used the rubric of mind, fearsome, anxiety, dread, frightened easily to represent his mental symptoms. And on the right in columns, we have matching homeopathic remedies. Verita carb, calcarea, phosphorus, sulfur, natrium muriaticum, and so on. In the second analysis, 
Dr. Steed used general's dwarfishness to represent the overshot jaw and three different mental symptoms to try to describe his sensitiveness and his startling behavior, along with his fear. Interestingly enough, we see similar remedies as the ones that were found in the first analysis. Sulfur, burrito carb, calcarea. On January 30th, 2014, a single dose of burrito carb 1M was prescribed. The striking symptoms of burrito carb that so closely match Taz's case are a lack of mental and physical development from an early age, almost as if the patient is frozen in their maturation process. There is fear and hiding behavior. Patients are easily frightened and afraid of strangers and cowardly, showing sudden ebullitions of anger, but coupled with cowardice. There is also extreme oversensitiveness of all senses, including an oversensitiveness to noise and voices. Another key symptom of this remedy is a child who does not want to play with others. In response to the homeopathic remedy, Taz began scratching at the bridge across his muzzle and showed excessive drooling and slow eating for several weeks and then again after three months. Two and a half months post-remedy, he was examined and found to only have a slight overbite remaining. Four and a half months post-remedy, the overbite had completely resolved. The owners also noted that in the first few weeks after the remedy, Taz demonstrated a general increase in his confidence with people and less fear when voices were raised. This positive response continued. He began playing with other dogs, there was a hierarchy shift in the pack, and he started coping with the world, demonstrating excellence in his training. Six months following his remedy, Taz's owners considered him to be the best behaved dog in the home of working dogs. On November 26 of 2014, Taz's burrito carb was repeated in a 10 M potency for a minor increase in hyperactivity and weariness around people. He responded again, improving gradually over several weeks with generalized increased confidence and becoming more relaxed with people. His behaviors are now classified as within the normal limits for working border collies. In summary, homeopathy matches a remedy to the patient's complete symptom picture. This remedy must create the same symptoms of illness in a healthy patient that are seen in the sick patient. Similia similibus carenter means that a similar remedy will stimulate the vital force to cure the patient. This results in a rapid healing response that leads to a rebalance and return of the patient's well-being. In the long term, the patient achieves a higher state of health. Homeopathic prescribing is rewarding because instead of suppressing the symptoms of illness, we have the ability to cure the underlying disease. The Pitt Karen Institute of Veterinary Homeopathy, also known as the PIVH, offers the professional course in veterinary homeopathy. This is taught by Dr. Richard Pitt Karen and faculty instructors. There are five four day sessions over a one year time period, resulting in more than 130 hours of classroom instruction. The 2017 2018 course begins in September of 2017 in Portland, Oregon. More information is available on our website at www.pivh.org. There is also advanced homeopathic training and continuing education available for graduates of the homeopathy course. There is the option to become a certified veterinary homeopath. This certification is offered through the Academy of Veterinary Homeopathy and is a one to two year process following the PIVH course. Applicants are required to submit four cured cases treated with homeopathy, two acutes and two chronics. Once these cases are reviewed and accepted, there is a written examination. Additional continuing education for veterinary homeopaths is offered through the Pitt Karen Institute of Veterinary Homeopathy's annual advanced meeting and the Academy of Veterinary Homeopathy's annual meetings and journal. Our recommended reading list has several options for introductory and advanced reading. For more information on veterinary homeopathy, please see Dr. Pitt Karen's Complete Guide to Natural Health for Dogs and Cats. 
Dr. Jensen's Practical Handbook of Veterinary Homeopathy, and Dr. Hamilton's Homeopathic Care for Cats and Dogs, Small Doses for Small Animals. Advanced reading includes The Science of Homeopathy by George Vitilkis and The Organon of the Medical Art by Samuel Hahnemann. Additional resources for information on veterinary homeopathy can be found at the Pitcairn Institute of Veterinary Homeopathy's website, www.pivh.org, and email address info at pivh.org. The Academy of Veterinary Homeopathy's website is www.theavh.org, and their email address is office at theavh.org. Thank you very much for joining us today in our webinar, Introduction to Veterinary Homeopathy. Please don't hesitate to contact us for more information or to enroll in the upcoming course.